Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our UVM End of Life Doula Program webinar and information session today. We're really looking forward to sharing information and keeping an eye out for those questions. You'll notice um, our folks that are joining us on YouTube today that the chat is not working just yet. We're working on that. And once that is um, populated, you will be able to ask questions um, throughout the presentation. So good afternoon. My name is Nicole Lewillier-Fenton. I work in our Continuing and Distance Education Department. And our End of Life Doula programs are in partnership with UVM's Continuing and Distance Education and the Robert Larner College of Medicine. We have a full agenda today, and we always have a lot of questions um, with this program. So we're really looking forward to getting to those questions and get through, getting through uh, what is listed on our agenda. So we will do quick introductions. We will meet our program director, Francesca. Um, what is the role of an end-of-life doula? Um, what is the end-of-life doula professional certificate program? Course objectives and structure. How does this course work? For many folks, this is uh, your foray into online learning. So we'll talk about what does that look like. Also, we're offering our second session of our new companion animal end-of-life professional certificate program. So we'll talk about that and see a few quotes and testimonials from some uh, students who have just participated in that program. In addition, we'll talk about the application process and upcoming deadlines and a really exciting opportunity uh, for uh, folks to take advantage of a discount that is still offered today on these programs. As I mentioned, my name is Nicola Willier Fenton, and we have the wonderful opportunity to talk to Francesca Arlindy today, our program director. Francesca, thank you so much for being with us today. It's good to see you. You as well. Thanks for having me. Of course. And Francesca, you see a little bit about here on the screen here. She is the author of Cultivating the Doula Heart, The Essentials of Compassionate Care. Um, and that is an integral part of the course as well, that book. A graduate of UVM in 2003. She is a birthing doula and an end-of-life care doula. And now, end-of-life um, companion animal uh, doula as well. But we always say behind Francesca in our program, is an entire team of people. And we are continuing to add to this team. So Francesca and I were just looking at these pictures before we got started, and we're missing a few. And so we apologize um, to any of our new um, coaches that may be not on the screen with us today. But we are continuously adding um, support network to our end of life team. Francesca, this has got to be probably a really amazing point for you to reflect on, that this is the team of people that help to support our teams of doulas across the country. Do you want to just share with us maybe a little bit of the progression of the course and how, how we've gotten to this point to have such a large team supporting us? Sure. I love seeing all these spaces. They just feel like like-minded folks in my community and I can count on them and we are so fortunate to have their expertise and their stories. These faces that you see are not only our coaches or facilitators within the course, they're also the subject matter experts that we feature throughout the course. So we have people from palliative care, we have people from hospice care, we have some hospice volunteers, we have some spiritual care providers, we have a hospice volunteer coordinator, or two or three actually. We have people who work in the area at AgeWell, a wonderful organization. We have a healing touch practitioner. We have a practicing doula or two, such a wide variety, a nurse. And then we have people who work in the funeral industry. So we feature all of their voices, plus even more than what you're seeing here. It's very rich. It is so true. It's such a reward to see um, such an amazing team um, that helps to support this program. So let's talk about the program a little bit. I'm sure many folks are wondering, what is an end-of-life doula? What is end-of-life care and the professional certificate? Francesca, can you walk us through what is the role of an end-of-life doula? Sure. We have people come through the course with a variety of goals in mind, and we really attempt to cater to all of those goals. So when we talk about an end-of-life doula, it really can mean different things to different people. When we are focusing on the private practice doulas, then we're thinking about people who are hired, if they're charging money for this service, hired privately by a client, and that client's 
family, if that client has a family, loved ones, uh, friends, the surrogate, the healthcare proxy, whoever's intimately involved in that person's end of life journey, we work in tandem with all of those people in addition to hospice, palliative care, whatever medical care, holistic medical care that they're receiving as well. So we are an adjunct professional who has a unique set of skills that help complement what's already available. So we hear comfort for the dying, coordination of care. We provide non-medical support. So we focus on the emotional and spiritual aspects of the end of life journey. We assist with legacy projects. So that can begin with some informal life review generally. Doulas are story catchers. We are story listeners. We love to sit while someone reminisces and thinks back on the good times, on the challenging times, on the joys, on the regrets. And then sometimes we're able to turn those conversations into a lasting legacy, so into a present for the survivors of that person, for the, the loved ones. That could be a recording, it could be video, it could be audio, it could be a written account, it could be a scrapbook, it could be a photo compilation that's done online and can be shared with music. It could be a family cookbook. It really varies depending on that particular person. So each of these projects is very unique. We also can provide respite care for exhausted family members. We can sometimes be on call for vigil and vigil support and be a part of that process when our client is actively dying. We can also assist with things like advanced care planning and the options, connecting people with resources. We have our doulas develop directory lists throughout the course. So each module has a different, different focus. And then according to that focus, we ask our learners to look to their local community and discover what is available and then put that list together so that they could share that with their clients and lean on it themselves as well. So much important work that many of us don't think about until it's uh, either presented in this kind of way that you might be thinking about what are those plans or thinking about asking your family members what are your plans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that I find so fascinating about our conversations when we talk about this program is the popularity of it and the interest that people have in learning more. Why do you think that there's been such um, an interest and in a, you know, a draw towards our end-of-life doula program and end-of-life care in general? I think that there is a reawakening to this as being a very human process, an inevitable human process, instead of sort of keeping it in the shadows, it's lurking, we all sort of logically know that we're mortal, yet we don't want to face it, we don't want to think about it, we don't want to plan, because then that makes it true. And that's scary. And now people are really trying to claim that. Just as we saw in the 60s, in the 70s with birth, as this time of, you know, we, we know that this is a human experience, we want to have personalized care when we ourselves are facing, you know, birth and, you know, experiencing birth and labor and then also end of life. So I think that that's part of it. People are waking up to the fact that we, if we know more, if we plan better, it frees us up to even enjoy our time of living more deeply. And then it relieves such burden at end of life for people, not only for our clients directly, because we've had some of these really important conversations and because it doesn't all feel foreign and surprising, but also for their loved ones because they're not left wondering and questioning, potentially arguing over things during a time when leaning on one another and connecting could really facilitate a more healthy process emotionally for everyone. So I think that's part of it. And then I also think that people who are working in the field are in general just incredibly dedicated practitioners. So whether you're talking about mental health professionals or spiritual care workers or hospice volunteers or physicians, nurses, nurses aides. These people are so eager for additional training, additional approaches, for expanding their tool bags. We get a lot of people who 
aren't necessarily planning to hang a shingle as a doula, but who are really eager to learn just some new, new perspectives through our training. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing that insight as you've been watching this program grow over the last several years. Um, I do want to recognize that many of our folks now watching on YouTube, um, unfortunately the chat is uh, disabled, um, not intentionally. We were hoping to be able to have your questions coming in this way. We are working on it, so stay with us. Um, if you are having some questions, please try to jot those down. Um, we will also um, share at the end as well our email address um, so that if you do have follow-up questions and we weren't able to get that chat fixed on YouTube today that um, we'll have an outlet for you to ask those questions. So let's get back a little bit to some of those objectives of the course. You made mention as to um, end-of-life doulas really kind of complement the care that is surrounding um, a, a client, a patient. Um, and so can you share with us, what are the, we have two objectives here. Walk us through, what is the goal of this program for students? So as a doula, whether we're charging money or we're a volunteer, a community-based doula, what we want to do is enter into someone's journey with our eyes wide open and our hearts wide open and ready to assess. And we look at what is already in place, what's working well, what is maybe not working well, what are the sources of stress, and where can we focus our efforts. It's really going to look different depending on each person's unique circumstances and whether that person has a really involved, strong, natural network or not, and the medical care that that person's receiving, and also that person's wishes. What are their hopes for this time? So just as with a birth doula, we enter into someone's pregnancy journey and also their birth, and we look at, okay, what's here, what's working, what's going well, and then how can I be of service? How can I fit into this scene in a harmonious way? Because we all have the same goal in mind, which is the best possible experience for our patient, client, person that we're caring for. So in our program, we spend a great deal of time oh, looking at hospice, who are the team members, what's involved there, what are the services that are available, and then palliative care as well, and in your local community so that we know the terrain, so that we're entering in feeling very familiar with this end of life journey and what it might entail for people, and then what else we could potentially introduce as options for our clients. And such important work um, that I know many folks um, have been drawn to and, and are considering. Um, you know, sometimes they're considering it because they've gone through a family member, losing a family member or a close friend, and felt that they weren't well equipped for that. I don't know that we ever can be, you know, super well equipped for that loss, but just um, the process I think that you describe and that students learn about um, can be very healing and inspiring in itself. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of these intended outcomes um, for the program. And we have about maybe four or five slides of these because there's a lot. And I think that that speaks also to the richness of this course, is to the, the breadth of things that you are trying to teach um, and for students to be able to walk away from. Maybe Francesca, just touch on a couple of these as we go through the slides. Um, and share with prospective students um, what are some of these intended outcomes? Sure, so I'm drawn immediately to the boundaries and that is something we cover about halfway through the course in particular. We're always sort of thinking about it, it's always on our mind, but we focus on it about halfway through the course and we have a number of scenarios that we go through and then prompts that we work through on the discussion boards and these are sticky these are gray, they're not black and white, the answers are not obvious, it's challenging. And so we work through them together and we look at them from different angles. And we try to imagine intentions behind what's happening in different dynamics within different family units and how that can affect our work. We also talk about triggers and our own shadow sides and our own unhealed wounds that we're carrying and what we need to do to take care of ourselves well before we enter into these intense situations with other people. 
we do cover the, the last one there, we cover the different common terminal conditions and diseases and some about pain management and the dying process physically because we feel like it's important for doulas to have an awareness of those even though we are not providing the medical care. We're not medicating people. We're not checking blood pressures. We are providing emotional support and also some comfort techniques that might be useful when we think about the atmosphere of the room or what someone's wearing potentially or a blanket or not or a fan blowing or a window open or the scents that someone can smell. So all of that is integrated in there. But we do like to give a summary at least of, of what you can expect from the physical process of dying and helpful reminders of when it's appropriate to really reach out to the hospice team, when to encourage our client and our client's loved ones to reach out, let them know about an update or a shift or that there could be other options available to them. And switching over to the slide, and again, I know there's a lot on here, but just um, touching on, we talked a little bit about the role and the scope of the doula, um, end-of-life doula. Um, I always think this is a really important point, the second one listed there, Francesca, about um, you know not focusing in on one specific religious belief. You really talk about a wide variety of different practices. Can you touch on that a little bit? We do. Our our core is cultural humility, and we talk about curiosity a lot throughout the course. We talk about beginner's mind, as is encouraged through secular Buddhism, and curiosity in general, having an open mind, being ready to ask questions, because even if we feel like we know something about our client going in or we learn something about them, let's say it's a particular their ethnicity or a particular religious belief or a spiritual practice of theirs. And we almost feel inclined to sort of check a box as a category. We hold back from doing that. And what we really want to do is learn directly from our client. Well, what does that mean to you? What does that mean for you? How can I honor that best? So we have one module where we really go into a lot of detail about this, about the practice of cultural humility, and we cover a, a range of fascinating videos and audio clips, podcasts, written articles that just sort of pluck out some practices from around the world that our learners might not otherwise be familiar with. It's, it's really fascinating. And one of the things, too, that's, I think, really important for people to recognize are different stages and facets. Um, and you list anticipatory grief, mourning, and bereavement. How much do you touch on those? We focus on grief in two modules, so it's pretty heavy, two of the eight. So in module two, we talk about the anticipatory grief, that preparatory grief, progressionary grief, step by step as things are changing, as a person's illness is, as a person is declining with their illness, what does that mean emotionally, physically, in terms of their dependence on other people and changing roles? changing dynamics within the family. And then later in the course in mod seven, we revisit grief, but we talk about mourning and bereavement, what happens after the loss and the emotions for loved ones of someone who has died. And we do have a slide too for uh, folks participating with us on YouTube that goes through those different modules. So we'll have a chance to revisit what Francesca just shared with us. So we're still on those intended outcomes. As I mentioned, there's a lot to learn in this course. Um, maybe is there something here that you want to touch upon, Francesca? Sure. I've talked about our directory list. So that's listed. And then legacy work, life reviews. So then we talk about anxiety and suffering. And we really try to honor the whole person and the wholeness of that person the entire way through. Even as their body is breaking down, we remember and treat them as a person who is who needs dignity and respect and support at every moment. And we understand that through the end of life journey, because there's so much mystery, there's so much we can't logically understand or figure out or truly even prepare for, that we, we have to be aware of that. And we have to um, think about the, the facets, the many facets of suffering. So there could be physical suffering and we might be able to address that with some comfort techniques 
that we cover in the course, such as even hand massage or brushing someone's hair, or asking the medical care team to sort of check back in if we have permission to talk to them directly. But then also the social suffering, the psychological, the emotional suffering. There are so many different ways that we could recognize suffering. And what do we do with that? What do we do with that internally ourselves as a response? How do we remain centered and calm and grounded so that we don't escalate the anxiety? And also, how do we support someone through that anxiety and offer a listening ear and offer helpful ideas for them to consider as they journey through? And you've talked a little bit about um, legacy projects and, and potential vigil wishes um, and creating that directory, you know, what are the services available to the family? Um, is there anything else here that you wanted to touch upon? I think people aren't always aware that they are able to develop vigil wishes in advance and how empowering that can feel just as someone who is going into the birthing experience could develop birthing wishes because in the in the moments of labor, it's not the ideal time to be answering questions when someone's saying, you know, what's working for you? What's not working for you? What could I do for you? What could we try? It's really best if you have those conversations ahead of time when you're in a place that you have the mental clarity to work through different scenarios and options and think about what makes me me and what do I value and what makes me feel safe and how can you treat me during those times that I might be feeling like it's really intense. As someone is entering into the time of vigil and they're no longer communicative, it's wonderful if we have a, a vision for that time. How can we surround you with comfort? How would you like for people to enter into your space? Do you want sounds? Do you want certain music? Do you want to hear life being lived? Do you want it to be really quiet and calm? Do you want us to light a candle? Do you want us to bake cookies once a day so that you're smelling chocolate chip cookies as you're in your most restful deep sleep leading up to, to your dying? So. A doula can facilitate those conversations. Of course, we always need flexibility, but it is really wonderful for people to go in with some concrete ideas for how to continue to provide support during that time when they can't ask their person any longer. Really good points. Thank you for sharing all of that perspective with us. And I'm going to just recognize again that our folks watching on YouTube today. We apologize that the chat is disabled. Um, that was not intentional. We were hoping to see your questions today. We are working on it. But if by chance we don't get the chat back up, um, you can email us any follow-up questions at learn at uvm.edu. Um, and we're going to do our best to hopefully go through as much of the questions that we do usually get asked um, on these information and webinar opportunities. So we're not done yet, so stick with us. We've got a lot more information to share with you. And Francesca also has a slide that we'll go over at the end that are those questions that get asked most often. So hang with us, and hopefully we'll be able to answer your question throughout this presentation. Um, so let's talk about this course structure. One question we get all the time is, how does this work? You know, maybe this is my first online course, or um, you know, remote learning that lots of people just went through in the last uh, four or five months doesn't necessarily equate to a instructionally designed online course like our end-of-life doula certificate program. So you get this question all the time, Francesca. So can you walk us through what is the typical week in our certificate program? What does that look like? Sure. So we have eight weeks, and our modules open on a Wednesday morning. And then they close on Tuesday night, so each learner has a week to complete the work. It's asynchronous, so it's when it's convenient for learners to jump into the, to the content and work through it. We have deadlines on Sunday night and Tuesday night. So we have discussion boards. That's where we really do a lot of our reflecting on the content, and we give prompts and then exercises, practice work for people to go out and do on their own and then bring back how did it go and let's talk it through. And then in our responsive posts to within the cohort, so to your classmate, we're asking you to really practice the doula voice. You're modeling 
what it is to be a doula, and that's developing throughout the eight weeks. We have the directory list as well, which I mentioned, which you have an assignment to add to your directory list most of the eight weeks. And then week five of eight, we open up our dignity therapy project, which spans from week five through the end of the course. And that's an opportunity to find a volunteer. And now almost all of our learners are, are completing this virtually, remotely, online, although some are able to safely meet in person with social distancing and masks and things. And this is a life review session and an interview that is recorded, either audio, video, or on paper. It depends on the preferences of that, that doula and that volunteer. And then we come back together and discuss how it went and what we learned through that process. We see that for most learners, it takes them about eight to 12 hours a week on average to complete all of the assignments, the readings, the discussions. If you have more time, we have a lot of for further learning resources available at the end of each module. They're optional. They're not included in any of our quizzes. We do have quizzes most, most weeks to kind of wrap up the information. And some people who don't have that extra time will just start to compile those resources to be able to revisit after the course ends, which is totally fine as well. It's all online. We don't have live sessions. It really wouldn't be fair because we have people from all over the world and who are in different time zones. But it's very interactive over the discussion boards. We also have a journal feature. So I read all these journals and that's a private interaction between the learner and myself and it's optional. But if someone really feels like they wanna disclose something that is maybe more private, but they'd like to surface it in a supported environment. We talk about those things over journals. We also have some prompts, which are related to the material that they're covering within the journals. And we have an open board as well. And in the open board, people can post anything relevant to end of life questions or a book I just read or a documentary that I would recommend. And also I come up with content for the open boards as well. So we keep people plenty busy throughout the eight weeks. And we hear so much from students and graduates of the program, what an incredible community that is built in this program. We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more in a moment. And Francesca has, has made reference to these modules throughout our discussion this morning, uh, this afternoon, actually. Um, and so I don't necessarily think we need you to go through and read these, Francesca, but is there anything, and we've talked about grief in two different modules. We've talked about turning towards suffering, preparing for loss, that vigil planning. Um, folks can probably take a look at what's on this screen, but we haven't talked about that bonus module. And I think that's an interesting one. You've alluded to it a little bit, you know, having the time to, you know, collect some different articles and some additional reading. But what else goes into that bonus module? So this is because we recognize some of our learners come through and they have a hope or an intention or plan to become a private practice doula. So we have compiled information. We feature different subject matter experts, people who are working in the field. We have a video library of frequently asked questions. So a provider who answers those questions about what she has learned in her journey of caring for people in her own community. We talk a lot about the role in the scope. We talk about the doula bag, what we can pack in there and different ideas for visits, activities and other life review legacy work and things like that, that you can personalize your care well for, for those who are requesting a private practice doula. And we cover things like what to include in your contract. We don't have templates that we, that we use or that we specifically recommend, but we do talk about what would you include in your contract? What would it entail? And then the legalities, we talk about insurance coverage, we talk about different models of businesses and give plenty of first steps and then resources to continue along that road. That's a great transition also to, um, we're going to see a video here in a few minutes um, from one of our graduates that has, um, you know, somewhat hung the the shingle outside, and then, but also created their own community. And we'll talk about that and we'll hear from her in just a moment because I think that is such a great example of um, stronger together um, and, and supporting each other um, in this work. 
And one of the things that you see here is just the immense community that grows as a result of the course and afterwards. Um, and the Facebook page for our, our UVM End of Life doula community is incredibly vibrant, lots of activity. It is a private um, group, that, so there needs to be an invitation and acceptance into. So, you know, it's something that I think that the graduates um, continue to participate in, and I think new folks coming into the program really seem to enjoy that initial feedback and answering some of those questions from the veterans, if you will, and the alumni from the program. And, and recently, we have also launched a podcast um, called End of Life Care from a Distance. And, and that's a little bit about what we're going to hear um, from one of our students here in just Can a I moment. Can I just go back to the Facebook for just oh, a quick yeah. sec, Nicole? Thanks. So it's, it is a public group, but you are asked a couple of questions that you have to agree to to be able to get admission into the group. I, I facilitate it, I run it, and as you mentioned, it's very vibrant. There is a lot of resource sharing. There's also, there are doulas who say, hey, I'm in this area, anybody else, because they want to connect and potentially work together and collaborate, or any doulas available in this area, because I know of someone who is seeking an end-of-life doula, which is really wonderful. So I would highly recommend people who are even interested in the program, we welcome you into this community. People who are graduates of other programs, we welcome you into this community. People who want to ask our graduates questions, they're always really open to talking about our training in more detail. Great. Thank you for raising that point. I appreciate you asking to go back to that. And that leads into this um, video that we have, this interview with one of our graduates. Her name is Diane Button. And and what you just described is exactly what Diane has gone out and done. She has, she's in Northern California, and she has created a, a doula network in Northern California. And one of the things that Diane and I were talking about recently when recording this interview is how has COVID changed end-of-life care? And, you know, it's changed everything for us. Um, but just thinking about the support that family, loved ones, um, clients, patients, other doulas need, it's difficult to do that in person now. And, and I know a lot of the restrictions are starting to loosen. But Diane in this video reflects on um, how she, ha she and other doulas um, that she has in her community have um, moved forward in trying to care from a distance. So um, Francesca and I are going to turn off our cameras here for just a second. We're going to play this video, and then we'll come right back with you. I had two thoughts about that. One thought is that the way we are right now with all of us isolated in place and having time to be more introspective, I feel like almost everyone is a client. I feel like, you know, we've all been given a diagnosis <laughs> to pause and reflect and go inward and maybe get your advanced directives in order and think about what matters. And so, um, in a way, it's the new people that have come out and reached out to us, maybe not even people who are terminally ill, but are aging and want to have their life thought through a little bit better. So in a way, it's brought us a new kind of client. Um, the changes are that, you know, obviously our work is so based on the human connection and sitting at the bedside and sitting to talk and go deep and we can't do that so i think the biggest change i've made personally is that i am checking in with people more often i won't let a week go by without checking in on someone and also i'm not going to the depths that i might normally go if i was sitting with someone my feeling is that if a client were to come to me and say i really am struggling with something to do with unforgiveness or unfinished business or a regret or guilt or something like of that nature, then yes, by all means, we'll go there. But I'm really not bringing that up right now. I'm trying to be in a more uplifting, positive space and work on mostly legacy projects that people can come out of this feeling like they've accomplished something and that, you know, they feel a little bit more organized and prepared and, and ready for the end of their life. So Diane was adjusting, um, and, and I have found certainly there's been a lot more phone calls 
um, different ways to communicate and to reach out in this time when we haven't been able to physically be together. Um, Francesca, have you guys covered this? Um, and, and what types of things are you hearing um, from your students and your doulas as to how they have adjusted to the circumstances that we're in and trying to care from a distance? I think we weren't sure how the pandemic would affect the course. We weren't sure if people would be as available to participate in the course. And we've been really relieved to see that people are engaging in the course. Our courses, are, our sessions are still full and people are so appreciative of this community, which can offer so much support because as Diane mentioned, there's this collective grief there's this collective anxiety and doulas, whether you're a physician with a doula heart or a nurse with a doula heart or a private practice doula, people who are compassionate caregivers are the ones that others turn to when they're worried, when they're suffering, when they're anxious. And so we're holding a lot for a lot of people right now. And within the course, we're able to kind of let our guards down and ask for support from one another. So I have a couple of open board discussion prompts. One that is, how are you taking care of yourself? What are your self-care strategies right now? Could you share them? We do cover self-care in the course in a module, but right off the bat, we have that invitation. Share what's working for you so that we can consider adding in some other self-care practices during this time for ourselves. And then a call for holding space. So. If there's someone who is ill, if there's someone who is dying, if there's someone who is lonely, if there's a particular place or community that's having a really difficult time for whatever reason, a doula could put in a request that we, the rest of the group, can hold space. And so we send messages that are supportive back and forth to one another. So I think it feels very safe for doulas within our community. And they're able to kind of recharge their batteries to be able to go out and serve the world. We also cover topics like you just mentioned with Diane, the podcast, and as well as other efforts that our graduates are involved in. We have one graduate who's getting her master's in divinity right now. And she and one of her classmates have developed an online resource, which is free and readily available and people can go on and discover different ideas for how to hold a vigil, how to hold a memorial service online and personalize it and create that sense of the sacred, even virtually. So we, we sprinkle a lot, of, a lot of those in and stories of people, stories of people who are experiencing loss right now and grief and, and how to honor that in its own specific way right now. Interesting opportunity to learn some different ways to approach it. And I think from here on out, we will see that some of these changes will stick, that we will at, in the least have a hybrid version or more options available for people. We, of course, in general, are yearning for that hug and gathering and traveling and the things that aren't available to us right now but also virtual funeral services have allowed those who live at a great distance to still feel connected and feel involved. So I think moving forward, we're going to see some of these innovations continuing on. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And, and hopefully we're and one of our other former um, doula alumni, Stevenson Bryce, I also interviewed recently, and he, he said, look for the light in the darkness. And so I think some of these practices that you're talking about can be a benefit of going through this challenging time. So I'm not going to read these quotes. I think folks at home uh, or wherever you're watching from can see. But what we really just want to touch upon is some of the feedback that our students provide um, as a result of going through the End of Life Doula program certificate. Um, and, you know, rich with content. We've been talking a lot about that in terms of the modules. Um, most students say that they found this incredibly challenging in ways that they didn't anticipate. Um, Sarah, who's a recent graduate as well, says this course helps prepare one to talk to people about death. 
Um, and, and her quote had gone on, and she was saying that she was preparing her own letter and, and thinking about um, her time and, and what that means to her family and how she can help be better prepared for her loved ones as well. Roxanne talks about um, that uh, her life on Earth has indeed made a difference, that going through this coursework has given her a renewed purpose um, to help and to heal. Uh, David talks about um, taking the skills and knowledge, and I think you hear this a lot too, Francesca, with into personal and professional relationships. It's that leaning in and that listening that I think you speak so well about in the doula program that I think many people pull into their everyday lives um, or their professional lives if they aren't um, working in the end-of-life care space. Um, and Mary talks about, um, and this kind of references as well, maybe that bonus module, you know, the types of services that she might want to provide in her own business um, and learning from other graduates of the program. Um, we're going to talk a f in a few minutes about the um, End of Life Animal Companion Certificate Program as well. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit more details there. We just offered this for the first time. Uh, and there are two different ways to approach this course. If you are a graduate of our end-of-life doula certificate program, you may be interested in the two-week portion of the course. If you have not taken the end-of-life doula certificate program, the four-week portion of the companion animal course may be more appropriate. We'll get into that in just a moment. But I wanted to share um, some feedback and some quotes from some students who just went through this program just recently. And the program is, again, being offered coming up in September. Um, and Kimberly, um, who I'm, I think was also a graduate of our um, certificate program, um, talks about applying what she's learned on the companion animal side, uh, those new skills and knowledge um, with her clients. She's an animal Reiki practitioner and currently have a hospice patient dog and felt much more prepared to assist that family. Um, and so there's a direct outcome of the companion animal. And Susan talks about um, just the knowledge that she was able to gain from the instructors and from the guest speakers um, that I know that you have in the program as well. So while the um, End of Life Doula Certificate Program is so rich with content and perspectives, the companion animal is as well. And Martha talks about Francesca's summary and comments helpful, clarifying, and inspiring. And Dr. Susan and Ken's videos and their information was excellent. Um, and also, I think this is very tr telling of our end-of-life doula care programs, is Karen says that it reminds you that each client, animal, vet, and death experience is different, and that you really need to be able to lean into that and to um, come with an open heart as you so often talk about. Any thoughts just before we get into the rest of the program today? Francesca, what is your feedback and feeling after completing our first companion animal course? Oh, I really enjoyed it. It was wonderful. I learned so much from our groups. We ran the two sections. So we had the four week with brand new doulas to our program. The first two weeks cover essentials, and then the latter two weeks really focus in on pet end of life. And then with our grads coming back for those two weeks, they were in a separate group. It was wonderful to hear their stories, their personal stories of loss and grief, and how they've memorialized their pets, and the support that they received that was beneficial and that maybe wasn't so beneficial, some of that grieving that's still happening in their journey, and then to hear from our subject matter experts as well. We have such amazing voices throughout the course, whether it's vets, we feature three different vets. We have two small animals, small animal vets, and then one vet who focuses on horse care, which is really fascinating. We have a mental health clinician who talks about grief, anticipatory grief, bereavement, mourning, children's grief. I know we have a slide that I think that I'll, I'm just sort of jumping in right now. But I felt like it was incredibly illuminating for me to just really dive in, just as with the regular doula course. I spent a year cultivating the content and curating and organizing it and putting it together. But then it's the learners who really bring it to life and add this amazing 
dynamic. And so I'm always learning. We're wrapping a course today. We have one finishing tonight. It always feels like a joy and a loss. And people do experience that at the end of our programs. It's difficult to say goodbye, and it's a beautiful practice to say goodbye as well. So I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to offering it again in September. Thank you for that perspective. And while you were talking, I did zip over to the slides so that oh, folks yes. follow along our topics. with some of the things that you were mentioning. So thank you very much for talking about that. Um, I do want to, before we get into just deadlines and logistics, um, and again, thank you everyone on YouTube. We apologize that the live chat is not working. That was certainly not our intention. We wanted to have lots of questions from you today, but hopefully we've been able to touch on um, many of your questions. We have a few more slides to get through to on the application and the process for that as well and dates. Um, if you do have a question that we weren't able to answer today, please email us at learn at uvm.edu and definitely put in that subject line, you know, follow-up question to the doula um, info session webinar today, and we'll make sure to get that answered for you. But Francesca, before we get into those logistics of deadlines and application process, um, share with us what we're seeing here on this screen. So this is one of our images from the course that really includes the, the doula essentials and how we cultivate that doula heart. We talk a lot about unconditional positive regard. That's something that we cover in mod four when we go into the first out of two of these doula essentials and this is how we're able to practice compassion which is right next to it so it's holding someone in unconditional positive regard which means that we have deep trust in their inherent wisdom and in their ability to navigate their journey and when we hold that trust even when they're doubting themselves it creates this feeling of of buoyancy during a time that can feel very chaotic and very unstable. And we know that step by step, moment by moment, we're going to see them through with our intentional presence, with staying calm, with not passing judgment, not coming in with an agenda of our own, not feeling like we have everything figured out for this person. We know their correct path. And turning toward the uncomfortable, turning toward the suffering, allowing it to surface if someone wants to air some of their concerns and worries instead of minimizing instead of brushing it under the carpet instead of trying to look at the bright side of what's happening we create space for whatever this person needs to explore during during their end of life journey thank you for explaining that i always love hearing you talk about that image um, as we get into some of the logistics of the course deadlines i do want to share with everyone who is participating today, that um, we are looking at uh, enrolling for the October session of our End of Life Doula. Our August session, um, which will be starting soon, is indeed full. Um, and so we're really encouraging people who are interested in our End of Life Doula, the uh, professional certificate, to um, enroll into our October session. And up until August 1st, so the couple more weeks here, you can take advantage of a 25% discount for the August, excuse me, for the October session. So just really wanted to encourage, if this is something you're thinking about doing and you want to sign up for the October session, you can take advantage of this discount as long as you register before August 1st. So just wanted to um, throw that out there that if you're considering it, there's a savings opportunity happening still right now, even for a program that's starting in the fall. The same also goes for the Companion Animal Program which is coming up starting in September, you can apply that same discount if you register before August 1st. You can apply it to the Companion Animal Program starting in September. So if you're thinking about it, don't wait <laughs> because our sessions fill very quickly and this is an opportunity for you to save some money on the programs as well. So here are the logistics. Our End of Life Doula Professional Certificate Program, as I mentioned, our August session is full and we are enrolling now for October. And so the dates are listed there. Um, I don't even want to think about winter yet. It doesn't seem like October should be winter, but there it is um, as it crosses over into December as well. Um, and the registration deadline is October 14th. But again, if you are interested in this, you can take advantage of that 25% discount if you register before August 1st, even for that October session. Um, 
And so you do see that the, a deposit is due at the time of registration. We've been talking about the Companion Animal course, um, and you can learn more about that on our website as well. Or you know, send us an email at learn at uvm.edu if you have more specific questions about the Companion Animal. But here's what Francesca's been talking about. There's a two-week section, which is um, for end-of-life doula, our, our graduates of our certificate program. And then there's a four-week certificate in our companion animal of folks that are new to do, for doula and have not gone through our professional certificate program. And you can see the different start dates of those. The four-week starts September 2nd. The two-week starts September 16th. And again, you can apply that same 25% discount if you are interested in starting either of these in September, but that discount expires on August 1st. So let's circle back around. I'm hoping that we've answered many of the questions of our folks who are joining us on YouTube. Again, I apologize that the chat functionality is not working. We weren't exactly able to figure that out, but hopefully we've been able to touch on many of your questions. Um, Francesca, let's just go through these briefly because I know we get these questions a lot. Um, what, what we've talked about the, the course, you know, opens on Wednesday and closes on Tuesday evening, but what are, what does a typical week look like? What are the assignments? What is a learner, um, should be expecting for a typical week? Sure. For someone who's new to Blackboard, it might feel very mysterious. We have the modules built out in advance, so they're all prepped and ready for you. It opens up. You're able to go through that at your own pace. I know that we had a learner this, this time around that's ending today who completed her work within two days of the modules opening, and that's just worked well for her schedule. We have other people who have to wait till the weekend to dive into the work, and that's totally fine. And you'll see videos, sometimes we have documentaries throughout, we have articles to read, we have reading assignments in our two books, we have interviews, podcasts, audio recordings, so our, a nice variety of curriculum throughout. And then we have the discussion board prompts, which as I mentioned, we have deadlines Sunday for the initial response that you're asked to complete. And then Tuesday as well, you have another initial response that's due Tuesday, but then also your responses to other learners in their threads that that's due Tuesday, well, along with the directory lists. And then the Dignity Therapy Project that sort of runs on its own time frame, but you're already well into the course, so it's, it's okay. But most people feel like they get into a rhythm that works well for them. If things come up, if there's a, an emergency or some sort of disaster in life and you're unavailable, we just ask that you check in and give us notice and we'll work through whatever you're facing and come up with deadlines that are gonna work and help support our learners through that. So we have, I'm involved with all of our sessions and then we also have doula facilitators. So they're assisting with the sections. We have groups of 25, so it feels like a nice close-knit community that builds throughout the eight week. You're with 24 on average other people throughout the eight weeks. And then you have a, a doula facilitator who is very available over email. And uh, we're always checking in on the boards. I'm always checking in on the open boards when people are posing questions. So we're very actively involved in the process. And then you'll see announcements that are coming out. I send out announcements to deepen the content, to deepen the focus, to give you more ideas for how to put this into practice, for how to embody some of these essentials that we're covering as we're sort of wrapping up each of the modules. Great. And we, I don't know, are you going to mention that we have our, our intro that opens yes. up the week before? Yep. Okay. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great one. Let me just pop back to this slide for just a second for everybody. Um, that registration deadline, that October 14th, that is when we also have an orientation. And so we have the registration deadline a week before the course starts to allow for folks to get in and learners to get into that orientation. So it gives everybody a chance to get acclimated, get comfortable with Blackboard, get comfortable with an online course, um, whether it's your first or your hundredth, um, it's just good to have that space to be able to get comfortable so that you can dive in when the course actually opens. Um, we've talked about 
anywhere between 8 and 10, 8 and 12 hours a week is usually what learners experience. Um, interacting with the instructor and the other students, I think you've touched on that as you were describing the different prompts and posts and, um, and journal, you were mentioning the journal as well. Um, and how online courses work, you've touched on that as well, that, that it, this is 100% this is online and this is at your pace. Yes, there are deadlines. Yes, there are days that the information opens. Um, and as Francesca said, sometimes people dive into that right away. Sometimes when I've taken an online course, I like to get in when it opens and see what is expected. So I really can plan out, wow, this week might be a little bit more heavy on that 12 hours. Um, let me change up you know, what this week might look like and what I was expecting uh, and then do some in advance of the weekend and then also s save that time on the weekend as well. So it's really how you figure it out and I think it takes you know, a couple weeks um, to really get that rhythm as well. Um, what do students receive at the completion of the course, Francesca? They receive a certificate of completion and also we are developing our badge right now. So that should be ready soon. Yeah, and that's a digital badge, so I'll share a little bit about that, and you can learn more about that on our website as well, it's learn.edu, um, uvm.edu, excuse me. Um, you can learn about the digital badges. This is an amazing way for you to visually showcase um, your learning. And so once you have completed the certificate program, there'll be a digital badge, a certificate of completion that you can add to your LinkedIn profile. You could add to your website, indeed, if you want to um, go into um, end-of-life care uh, services um, for people as well. The digital badge is an opportunity to show the, the credentials and the certification that you have also earned. So thank you for reminding us of that, Francesca. So just. A few reminders for everybody as well. Our end of life doula, how do you register? Again, the course begins October 21st, but the deadline to register is the 14th, so the week before. As we've mentioned, we fill up, and so oftentimes there's a waiting list. So if you are interested in joining in our um, October session, please don't delay, and please do take advantage of that 25% discount if you register before August 1st. Um, this is being recorded, so we will share the presentation out with everyone who has RSVP'd for us today. And here is just a quick information about the companion animal. As we mentioned, there's a four-week course that starts September 2nd, uh, and also that discount can be taken advantage if you register before August 1st. And then the second, the two-week course, excuse me, starts um, later in um, September as well. So it really just kind of depends on where you're coming in to that companion animal course. Um, I really wish we were able to capture your questions today. I apologize for everyone who's been so patient and listening to us on YouTube. Um, if you do have follow-up questions, something that we couldn't answer today as Francesca and I were going through all the information, please email us at learn at uvm.edu or give us a call and just make sure that you're indicating in that subject line, you know, follow-up questions um, on end-of-life doula. Francesca, thank you so much um, for being with us and thank you for leading our end of life doulas and our companion animal programs. Um, you know, I think you probably get this question a lot too is, you know, why is this work so important? Why have nearly a thousand people gone through this program? Why, why do you recommend that more, you know, maybe we can get another thousand um, doulas trained in our community? Well, I know for me personally, People ask me sometimes, you know, isn't it depressing? Isn't it tough? Isn't it challenging to support people through end of life and grief? I think it's incredibly meaningful and it gives you this clear sight into your priorities and into the choices that you're making. How are you spending your time? What is important to you? How are you treating other people? What are you doing to leave your mark in the world? It's also encouraged me to think about preparing my own. I have an end of life journal and it's a scrapbook of sorts. My family knows about it. They know where it is. So when it's my time to go, whether it's anticipated or not, they have this to turn to. They will be able to hear my voice through my words and hear these messages that I've prepared in advance for them. I feel like selfishly, it will help me surrender into the mystery of dying with a little bit more ease, knowing that I have done that work already for them.
because I think the hardest part is is saying goodbye to those that you hold so dearly. And so this will support them in their time of grieving. And I know that for many people that lifts such a burden and it also provides such purpose with, okay, how am I going to make this day count? Because it's one less in my grand tally. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone who has joined us today to hear about our end of life doula and the end of life companion animal programs. We really look forward to seeing you in the companion animal program starting in September and our next session of our end of life doula program starting in October. And please don't forget about that discount that if you are interested, please take advantage of that before August 1st. Thank you everyone who have joined us today. We wish you good health. We hope to see you in our programs. And Francesca, thank you. Have a great afternoon. We'll talk thank soon. Thank you. Take care.